all warmly welcome to the last of our four Arctic AHA dialogues at Arctic Design Week in Rovaniemi. Uh, in uh, Lapland, we are spot here we are spot on in the Arctic Circle and we have audience here in Arcticum, we have audience behind uh, a stream uh, on a different platform and then we have our Three, f three of our four invited experts uh, in Zoom. Uh, one of the experts is here uh, with me, uh, standing there next to me. But before we go to introducing the experts, uh, I will let me say a few words about our thematics. Before the thematics, though, I would like to mention that there will be a concert organized on Sunday evening in Rovaniemi at Lordi Square uh, as part of the last uh, program part of Arctic Design Week and the concert will be four piece and uh, the star of uh, the concert starting at uh, 18 hours closing at 21 hours will be Mr. Lordi himself the uh, winner of the Eurovision Song Contest, the only Finnish winner of Eurovision Song Contest in 2006. And the concert will be organized in collaboration with UNICEF and Red Cross. So hopefully as many as possible of you can take part in the concert as well. The uh, dialogue is the last one of the four, as I already mentioned, but this will also be a launch of a new discussion series, Global Design Talks. Global Design Talks is an initiative of Arctic Design Week and developed in collaboration with uh, some other excellent design weeks uh, in Europe. We will pilot, we will launch the concept here and we will organize a set of three other global design talks this spring. The next one will be in May in Munich, Munich Creative Business Week. And uh, that will take place 17 to 18 May. And then two others on 10 June. Uh, one in Barcelona Design Week and the other in the International Design Biennale in Saint-Étienne. So there's a follow-up to these discussions as well. The th about the thematics. 13 years ago, when uh, Arctic Design Week was created, uh, it all started with a strong connection to sustainability uh, then already. Arctic design as a concept is design uh, trying to achieve targeted to sustainable development of the Arctic region. And of course, it, it was already then related to climate change, but little did we know how strong the discussion would in 13 years become. So uh, the development has accelerated and we, we have kept the thematic in design weeks. We will certainly keep them in the future as well. And um, climate change mitigation is the umbrella thematic for us today as well. The theme for Arctic Design Week this year has been inspiring awareness. We are very aware that we need to raise awareness with as many audiences as possible. And the thematic for the dialogues has been reconnecting with nature. Reconnecting with nature is part of a European-wide discussion on climate change mitigation uh, and the new European Bauhaus initiative, which relates to, very much relates to, and perhaps in this scale, uh, the first time in Europe, to how art, design, architecture can support climate change mitigation and be part of finding solutions to it. So reconnecting with nature is one of the core themes that were identified by Europeans themselves. There was a, 
in intensive and six uh, month long uh, co-design phase in the beginning of the Bauhaus initiative where all Europeans were asked what would they see as important themes to develop further and reconnecting with nature became one of them. We wanted to have it here because we are in the Arctic and reconnecting with nature is actually, it's self-evident. We, we have always been connected with nature, we must always be connected with nature, but we are aware that the role of nature and connection to nature may vary in different parts of Europe and we are very eager to discuss this thematic as well. And for this final dialogue uh, and the launch of Global Design Talks, we especially want to raise the bar, be even more ambitious than, than up till now, and also discuss what comes next. Because we know that we have tackled with a huge complex problematics, so, and we know that we don't know everything yet. We don't know the actions to take yet. So we, we have great experts to discuss this thematic as well. But we will start from where we are now, move to the future. And um, to be able to do that, we need to know more of all of you. So let me ask the, the first question. Let me ask of you, uh, what do you really do? What, what, what is currently? Who, who are you? Who you work with? What, what is currently at, on your table? The topics that are timely for you at the moment in the big context of climate change and reconnecting with nature. And let me think, I have to turn to see your face so that you can see my back. So um, I, will, I would like to start with Let's start with Simon. I see that you have a bit tired eyes. If I'm correct, you are in, in uh, Colombia and you have a right. really early morning. So this is to wake you up. Tell us a bit more about you. Thank you, Payubi, for the invitation. And it's really an honor for me to be joining this great panel of experts. And I am indeed in Colombia. Uh, you are in the very far north and I am in the tropics. So that is a huge difference of climate, geographies, everything. So thank you, Paivi, for having me here on the distance. And my name is Simon Balen. I am a product designer from Colombia, currently based between the Netherlands and Medellin and Colombia. I am trained as an, both as an engineer and as a designer but I always like to say that my practice is much more in, uh, in relation to anthropology and material culture. And I am very interested in my work in the past and future of materials. I put materials at the center of my research questions and how those materials tell us stories about identity, heritage and colonialism. How do we tell the story through the global dynamics of goods and also how the resources are extracted and transformed. And currently I am working on a project that, that is called Suelo Orfebre, which means the land of goldsmiths, which is working, I am working with a gold mining community in Colombia, looking into the possibilities of using the waste streams to transform them into alternative materials. Uh, um, mining, as we know, and most of, unfortunately, extractive economies are very polluting. Uh, so I'm trying to use design as a tool to create um, objects and materials that can create economical, social and sustainable solutions. And recently, I've been also, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Perfect. <laughs> um, and I am also recently, I have recently and for the past years been working as a designer and researcher at Studio Forma Fantasma is a research based design practice between based between the Netherlands and Italy. 
and there I've been working as a sustainable consultant. More specifically, I had the chance to work on a project uh, actually with a Finnish furniture company looking at the um, looking specifically at the relations that the paper and paper industries have had on the impact on forests. So materials are the core of my work and sort of that's how I tackle design problems, looking at holistically what turns around those materials on a political, ecological, ec economical level. Thank you, Simon. Um, if I may ask uh, or continue this with you a bit, uh, you mentioned that that uh, you now live partly in Colombia, your home country, and in the Netherlands, and you, in your line of work, uh, also the, with the land of goldsmiths, you work with indigenous people as well. Uh, I happen to know that that you uh, know something about our indigenous people, Sami people as well. And uh, you know a lot about the Arctic as well. So think, t tell the rest of us where that connection comes from. Correct. Thanks, Bayou. Yes, I had um, some years ago, I had the opportunity to do my exchange studies actually at the University of Lapland. I was studying at the design, industrial design faculty but the program was much more focused on something that uh, up north uh, they call Arctic this time. And what I learned from that is how the, um, the natural and the geographical ecosystems shape a way of thinking of, uh, and, and a way of thinking of the, in the use of materials and resources and how that mindset shapes a design methodology. Um, so for me, being in Rovaniemi, being in the Arctic was very um, life changing because I got also to look back in perspective of where I come from and that relation that we have with nature. And I had also the, opportu the opportunity to work uh, together inside the Sami um, community, indigenous community of, uh, of the Inari Sami in the Inari Lake. Um, with Inka, Inka Kangasgemi, and she's an, a Sami artist who kindly um, introduced me to the community where I was doing a research about the meanings of warmth. So strangely, I was uh, researching warmth and I went to the coldest place on earth. So I feel, and, and the lessons there was that a lot of the indigenous knowledge um, that we can learn a lot from indigenous knowledge into possible future uh, solutions and not trying to replicate those models, but seeing on what can we learn from the past that we can apply today. And also Paidi and, and for the rest, I've been very much connected to the Arctic in many ways because I have also lived in Iceland and Greenland. So how does this uh, tropical, um, boy comes up in the end uh, in the in the up north so there's so much i owe to the arctic and the lessons i have gathered throughout the years from the different places that i have lived in uh looking into specifically how these harsh environments um what is our relation uh, to the ecosystems uh, uh, and to the context we live in even in these harsh environments so that's my connection to the Arctic and, and to the Sami, I, I owe a lot as well. I really value the, their knowledge and, and how they are guardians of snow. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, I, as I know you well from the time you, you were here as an exchange student, uh, I very much respect the way you have been able to sort of transfer the knowledge you have gathered always to new environments. Uh, in relation to indigenous knowledge and, res uh, knowledge and respect of that knowledge, we will come back to this during the discussion. Also because what you mentioned is and your respect for indigenous knowledge, this is also something which is strongly taken up with the latest IPCC uh, panel panels report. Uh, 
support, uh, sort of combining, putting together knowledge by research and knowledge by local conditions and indigenous knowledge. So you have been very timely in this already quite a few years ago. We will continue this introduction round to let's let's uh, have Lisa next from Colombia to are you in Brussels or where are you at the moment? Yes. Hi. Yeah, I'm in sunny Brussels. Um, Brussels, Brussels calling in the context of Eurovision Song Contest. I'm actually like <laughs> really jealous that you're going to meet Lordi, which I'm like a fan of. Um, so um, please send him my regards. It's a very Thank good you. example of like uh, how to make impact for like being different in a traditional room. And, you know, so I think that's the subtitle of what Lordi did also for the country and for the culture as well. So... Um, but actually that is also it's a good description for me is like, um, so I'm the orchestrator of uh, EIT Climate Kick for Policy in EU Affairs and the name is the game. This is what I'm doing. I'm kind of like an orchestrator because talking about climate kick and bringing people um, uh, together in the fight against climate change is, it's like you have to compose a orchest an orchestra with different instruments with different training and try to let them play in harmony so I'm basically just like running around trying to find out okay which instrument are you playing um, uh, what's your language what's your vocabulary but you know we all have to come together in a room it's called policy um, because the system we are in is not built for change especially not fighting against climate change so yes, we have we do have technologies, we do have solutions. There are a lot of bright people out there who have a lot of ideas, but we are all trapped in a system of silos. And so we have a systemic issue. And policy is like one of the attempts to try to bring us all together. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I know that, that you, you have been working for the Climate Kick for a while, but tell us a bit about what did you do before that? Yeah, so um, I'm not like a normal policy person. I kind of like came into this through different pathways. So I'm a little bit of a hybrid. It took me a while to actually find out for myself that this is not a bug, it's a feature. So I have an art background, a software engineering background and a business background. Uh, so with that, I traveled all across different worlds and that always enabled me to see the world differently. That's where the bug and the feature thing comes in, but also to understand the in-between spaces, the transition spaces. On the one side, it's a great opportunity for innovation. It's a great opportunity for inclusion and diversity, but that's also the problem what we have in the context of transition and transformation is that how to build the bridges, how to know. Sometimes you need a wood bridge, sometimes you need a cement bridge. Sometimes you don't need a bridge at all, you just go and use a parachute. But like, you know, the reason why we have issues with cross-sector communication is because we are all trapped in different worlds. And because I've been traveling all across the different worlds all the time by nature, I kind of like now turned into a bridge builder. Um, and especially in the context of culture and creative industries, which is such an exciting opportunity in time for the moment is because the European government has acknowledged culture, creative industry as actually a thing since 2019. It's like, hey, you do exist now also. It's like, well, you know, we were there before, but now what happens is that on a policy political level, Art and design is now also acknowledged as an industry which gives us, the designers, a huge power and influence. And what we are trying to do with Climate Kick is like to position art and design as the agents of change. Because there's a huge advantage for art and designers, they're everywhere. 
they're in mobility as well in aerospace, um, uh, uh, with textiles, with agriculture, food, you find art and design everywhere. So if we are enabling them as an agent of change and working with, uh, with us, to fight against climate change, the level of impact we can generate with that will be absolutely immense. But in order to do this, we have to educate because policy is a mechanical tool how to deal with a system, even though it doesn't make sense. But, you know, we don't have the time to burn down systems. We have to learn how to work with systems. And again, that means culture, creative industry is of utter importance. We call it um, uh, the transition narrative. This is about accessibility and art and design can emotionally warm up the room and emotionally connect to problems. And that's a huge power, but it's it's also it's like now it's like, you know, we have to go to, to artists and designers like, are you aware of this power? Do you understand what's happening? You're of utter, utter importance. Come with us in the room. We need we need more like more like you. So that's also one of the one of the things that I'm what I'm doing is besides trying to play the music, but also learn and study other new instruments and how to bring them together in harmony. Although this harmony also can be beautiful as well. Um, so yeah, but it's all about the music. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Lisa. And and uh, I have to say or tell people that that uh, what you have been doing uh, it has been recognized to the extent that you have you have you are also one of the uh, Forbes 50 women in tech list. So. So the level you do your work is, is also well recognized. When you mentioned that you're an orchestrator and it's all about the music, what I have to remind all of you at this point is that at two o'clock when we close the dialogue, don't leave the room because there will be something related to orchestrating uh, for you. So stay in the room, but that will be at two o'clock, and that it goes with you, Simon uh, uh, and uh, uh, Frederica and Lisa as well. Don't leave the room. Stay, uh, stay here so that you can hear what happens. It will be hopefully quite uh, exciting. Now, uh, all this said, very interesting uh, discussion or t uh, topics you touch, Lisa, and a reminder to everyone here and to who, who were here before as well, Michaela Magas, who is one of the, the uh, experts in the high level um, round table uh, for the new European Bauhaus initiative, also touched similar issues. So they, you are sending a message which has been strengthened by other people, experts in our dialogues or, already, which for me also mean that we are talking about topical things. We move to Frederica. So tell us about yourself and the work you do. Sure. Thank you for having me. And, and so interesting to hear Simone and Elisa and I, I feel really connected to their story as well. Um, I work with sustainability at the Swedish electric car company called Polestar. We're a very young company, up and coming in the automotive industry. We have one car on the market today, Polestar 2, that I know that you've gotten to, uh, to uh, drive, maybe. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, and you had some good input to us. So we really appreciate that. Uh, and well, my background is within environmental systems analysis. I studied that at Chalpermesh in, in Gothenburg, uh, and there it opened up my eyes to what Lisa was talking about, the importance of a systems perspective when we look at this planet and nature and people and how we cannot uh, think in silos. Uh, but, but rather that we have to be able to transition different sectors, industries, government, business um, in a seamless way to really secure that we, that we promote sustainable development in a true way. Uh, and since then I've worked with sustainability uh, in business because it really fits my temperament. I'm quite impatient and, and very creative and I, I really feel like I'm 
I can I can work in the speed and the pace that I want in business with sustainability. So I've worked in at IKEA uh, with furniture, and then also at a Swedish fashion company, and now I'm in the car industry. And at Polestar, I get to work with sustainability in a whole new way than I've ever experienced because we find ourselves in this significant time for the car industry where we so clearly see how we impact the rampant climate crisis that we are in, um, but other environmental aspects as well, the biodiversity loss, for example, ecosystem destruction, how we impact people in, in, in value throughout the value chain, both those who drive our cars, but specifically uh, those who work in our supply chains. And we so clearly see that electric vehicles can be a solution to meet these challenges already today. We know that electric vehicle is a climate solution already today. It comes with a smaller carbon footprint over its life cycle than that of a comparable petrol car. And we really want to use this time now to accelerate the transition into electric mobility. Uh, and, and we are really pushing, trying to push the industry forward here in, in really moving in a quicker way and setting all the targets. But we also want to start up a conversation, an honest conversation, about how electric mobility can truly become sustainable. Uh, it's better, but it's not good enough today. So we want to talk about how we can really embrace true circularity, uh, inclusion, transparency, uh, while of course working with the climate issues that are so that are so pressing. Thank you, Frederica. The question I have for you for you is that you said that that you are committed to uh, opening and leading an honest conversation and you meant, you talked about uh, on what issues but my question is who do you have the honest conversation with uh, it, th this is a really interesting question because some a question that i've gotten throughout the years when it comes to uh, sustainability communication in business is that well, the, the consumers don't care about this information. Why do you want us to, to talk about this at all? Uh, but the, the fact is that we need to be the ones who make it interesting to the ones who need to hear it. And that goes for consumers, that goes for uh, authorities, that goes for industry colleagues. So at Polestar, we, we want to really put this forward to all of the stakeholders that we need to get on board to really accel accelerate the, the transition. So we have, for example, launched a product sustainability declaration. Uh, you will see the carbon footprint for all of our car models as a consumer. You will see the risk minerals that we trace. We want to bring in uh, much more information about the materials and design features in the car connected to sustainability to really inspire them in becoming more curious about sustainability and, and really seeing this great solution. Um, it, it's also a means to really spread action and hope uh, in this time where, you know, we, we focus on the negative um, at all times. So being honest about the challenges, but also being really transparent about the amazing, amazing tools and solutions that are out there in terms of materials and uh, solutions and technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Frederica. I think we will, we might come back to this because this is also a quite a sort of a multi-layered and complicated question. So be prepared that we continue this at some point, but let's, let's have our fourth invited uh, expert who is happily here with us in, in Rovaniemi, Elsebet your story or what you want to say to begin with and a bit about yourself as well please yes i could start on a i could start um, on a very personal note because i was one of the first um, uh, people in denmark to get covid and i was also hospitalized so for t some few days i um, was worried uh, that i was going to die 
but I got out and I came home. And um, during the few days I had been away, uh, Denmark and rest of the world or most of the world has closed down. So my family uh, and I, we went to our summer cottage uh, on the west coast and we spent one and a half year there. Um, and uh, it was quite interesting for the, because you could do nothing. So I uh, went to the sea every morning and uh, uh, was swimming also during the winter time. Not swimming, but <laughs> dipping in. Dipping in, yeah. Uh, and I went for uh, many walks in, in nature and I came to love nature again somehow because I have. Yes, I think I have lived very disconnected from nature uh, for many years. So I came closer to nature, but I was very uh, close to my family. I found out what my husband, he was actually doing, because I was listening to all his team's talks. Uh, and I found out what my daughter was learning uh, in, in school. So it was, it was great uh, to find out some, uh, yeah, to be more, become more aware about what are the values uh, in life. And we discussed it in the family. So now we have bought a small farm in the same area where we have our summer house. And we are on our way to um, design a very big uh, garden where we will grow our own vegetables. So I think that these crises, both the climate crisis and the COVID crisis, uh, has done something to me and uh, to my personal life that is very important. So I have uh, also decided to re uh, to um, um, retire from uh, my permanent job. So now I have my own consultancy within public affairs and sustainability. Um, so this is a, a quite new life situation. Crisis uh, means uh, new possibilities. I think it comes from uh, Greek, uh, and that is what I have uh, experienced. So that's what I could say about my personal situation uh, just now. But of course, I could also say something about my professional uh, or more professional perspective, because um, in 2020 and 2021, I was the head of uh, all the folk high schools uh, in Denmark. And I had a very good connection to young people. And I found out that I, I think the biggest problem, well, one of the biggest problems we have just now, is that young people, they, uh, they, they, they lack hope. So we have somehow m gone through a movement from uh, denial to despair. And perhaps this is a... Uh, one of our biggest uh, crises that our young people, they don't have hope and uh, perhaps many others don't have hope. So um, it makes it very difficult to act because if you have nothing to attach your hope to, uh, then, you cannot, uh, then, you, then you cannot act. And also in a professional perspective, I think it's very interesting that uh, the International Energy uh, Agency has found out that it will only take around 2% more of our gross national product to address the climate crisis. We have the knowledge, we have the uh, technology, we, and actually we also have the money, because 2% is nothing. We spent as I remember it, certain percent of our gross national uh, product to address the COVID crisis the first nine months of 2020. So 2% is nothing. So why are we not doing it? Why are we not just deciding to save us, ourselves, to rescue ourselves and our the future generations? I think it's because of this lack of hope that we don't know that we have nothing that we have that we are too scared uh, so perhaps our 
you also asked what is next uh, mm. in, in this uh, conference, and I think the next big issue to address is the lack of hope. So we must somehow, as designers and also in a transdisciplinary perspective, address this lack of hope. We must design hope. I'll write that down, design hope. Uh, listen, Elisabeth, um, you, you mentioned what you have been doing during the past few years um, and what has happened has made you what you are today, of course. That happens to all of us. But in your, there, you have a really interesting history, career-wise as well. Um, I think it's important because it, it creates the context as well. You, you used to be the Minister of Culture in Denmark at one point and a member of parliament for quite a few years and you were also rector of the Kolding Design School, Kolding Design University in Denmark. So you, you approach issues from very many many different angles and this is actually to refer to to all of you in in many ways uh simon you are young still uh almost you know you're very young compared to me certainly uh but um also you have done a lot of uh, things already from different types of aspects, o also with your training, uh, and and we know Frederica's uh, background is is uh, um, includes a lot of uh, experience from different parts and things as well. At least are the same with you. So am I correct that in a way, uh, what we need or what where we benefit from? in our current world, with all the challenges we have to face, um, experience across disciplines, within an individual, but also between people, organizations, uh, benefits and helps us find solutions. Would you say that that would be true? Yes, that it is uh, important to... Uh, sorry, I didn't understand your question. Uh, that is it used because w what I hear from this dialogue, the peop the invited experts, I hear that from the earlier uh, earlier uh, dialogues as well, that people have uh, experience and understanding not only from one field but a lot of fields. Mm -hmm. And now that we have this huge. Uh, challenge re related to climate change, relate, we had it related to COVID. Uh, do you think it's useful that, that individuals have a lot of uh, experience and knowledge from various fields? Uh, yes, and um, that's also why it's so important to um, educate students in a specific way. I think that all our uh, uh, all our candidates should be T-shaped. It means that they should have special uh, knowledge, for instance, as an engineer. But at the same time, we must teach them uh, other disciplinaries as well, so that they are able to collaborate with people with, um, with other backgrounds. But of course, it is also very interesting if you are so lucky as uh, as a person to have a career where you get different experiences. Because I've been lucky and I have been doing a lot of, uh, of different things. I have been a politician and I have been uh, uh, a leader uh, for, for many years. And I have worked with the private sector and civil society and, uh, and the public sector. And I can see now that when I'm a member of a board, I have I really have the uh, possibility to take different uh, perspectives uh, and it's easy for me to to understand the other people in the back uh, in in the boardroom because I have a, a long uh, uh, I, have I have many different uh, experiences uh, from my uh, professional uh, life mm. so it is important and and I think that's what all of you are, are doing uh, mm. it is to be aware that we can learn from people with another background in our, uh, than our uh, own background. 
Thank you, Elsa. Maybe, maybe, um, yes. maybe, maybe I can offer a very concrete example of the importance of, of just that. I think we all agree uh, that that is crucial collaboration and, and, and having a diversity of knowledge and experience and competences to really uh, tackle these immense challenges that we are facing. So we, we've decided to create the Climate Neutral Card by 2030. We, we call it the Post Our Zero Project. Uh, and with that, we wanted to create a sense of urgency amongst our designers and en engineers, uh, but also uh, towards suppliers, all of the layers of the supply chain, in industry stakeholders, that we need to start bending the curve uh, this decade. Um, so we kind of put the signal out there that we need to have a new way of working with, with uh, climate in the automotive industry. We need to open up as businesses. We're in a very conventional industry where you don't, you, you, you really hold on tight to your IP rights and you're very concerned about, about, of course, for good reasons, competitive laws and so on. Uh, but we really need to completely change our mindset. So we put out this in a very outspoken way this moonshot goal that we have set for ourselves to catalyst um, a great collaboration. So, and, and we were so happy to announce just uh, the other the last month that we have now signed on uh, really impactful industry companies in this project that we have and we will run the coming seven to eight years. For example, the Swedish steelmaker SSAB, the Norwegian. Aluminium producer, hydro. We have the safety um, um, uh, aspect uh, together with the auto lid and so on. And, and ZF and SKW as well have signed on. And, and we've also put out the call to action to innovators, researchers, um, startups, well, anyone really who can come in with ideas for how to create the climate neutral car by 2030. So we are, we are trying to change the way this very conventional industry is operating so that we can collaborate more, we can open up for, for, um, for other companies, competences that, than what we have in our companies. And uh, yeah, the response has been amazing, uh, to say the least. So, you know, we have 20,000 plus components going into a car. They all have to be produced in a completely climate neutral way for um, uh, Pulsar Zero. So you can just think of the engineering skills, the, the designer skills that will be needed to, to secure that all of those components uh, is fitting for, for this project. Can I ask, Frederica, uh, you describe a really Im interesting approach and I'm sure a much needed uh, approach uh, as well, but how exactly do you, because this is, this is sort of a complicated structure or a multi-layered network related structure where if I read this correctly, you have, uh, you have taken care of the whole value chain related to mobility and of course in the end manufacturing a car. But as you said, it's a very complicated collaborative structure that's needed. But where exactly here do you see the role of design? Well, what we have done with this project is that we have delimit we, we have actually set very clear boundaries. So it's not a big fluffy goal. And we don't take in the whole value chain perspective. For, the, for example, the use space is not included in this project. And I think that that is one of the key uh, success factors to really be brave enough uh, and, and to set a very specific and measurable goal, you know. So we're going we're gonna to focus on all of the emissions from the raw material extraction to when the car leaves the factory gates uh, and reaches the consumer. That is the, the scope of this project. And I think that is crucial to also secure that uh, it can be done in this short amount of time. And of course, we will also uh, take into account and work on all of the other aspects of the value chain. Uh, absolutely. 
Um, so, and, and we've also been really uh, structured in the way that we divide the work now during the seven to eight years. So it's really clear for all of our collaborators the different phases this project is going to uh, go through. So we have a first um, research period where, where we will have to have um, um, designers, engineers together with researchers looking at, okay, so how do we eliminate emissions from the, the material uh, uh, processes uh, and productions? Um, how do we remanufacture? How do we reuse components in the car? Um, and then we will come into an advanced engineering stage where we actually start working with the, a more practical uh, stage where we start working with kind of the components that are needed for, for a specific car. Uh, and then the, the last years will be all about the product development. And then that will be run like your average product development uh, um, uh, or, or car project, of course. So, so I think that actually making it more concrete, often companies just feel safe with setting out the big fluffy goal. Uh, but what we have done is made it really clear on what we will focus on and what kind of competences we need, I think. Thank you. Elisabeth, give me a second. Elisabeth wants to say something, and I'm sure I would also like uh, especially Simone to react because that's sort of a, related to what you do as well, but in a different scale. And then, of course, Lisa, the, the uh, huge consortium of a climate kick reaction to it. But before I let Elisabeth do it, Sid, you didn't actually uh, answer my question. I asked. Uh -huh. So uh, what I wanted to do was to just to repeat your qu uh, okay. question. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay, so Elsabeth and I will come back to the original question. Where do you see the role of design in this? You described it beautifully, but tell us also where does design fit in that process? In, in, from your point of view. Well, in, in so many ways, but one very crucial way is that we have to design um, our current cars in a way that we can uh, use the, the components and materials from that car in the future cars to come. Uh, and that is where we really need our designers to think about the architecture of the car, the, the, um, the materials going into the car in a whole new way and not only think about the coming six or seven years when we, we will have this, this car in, in production, uh, but really how it fits into the grander scheme of things. That's one example. Um, but of course, the, I mean, at the heart of this project is material knowledge also. Um, and, and here you, you have designers coming in and also looking from the perspective that we have, what is a premium material? We're, we're a company in the premium segment. We believe that a premium material today needs to be sustainable and innovative. And we need to, in the premium segment, really invest in, um, in new and innovative materials that can then be uh, used um, and scalable for the whole industry. We have that responsibility, we think. And, and here as designers, you really need to redefine um, how you think about materials. Um, yeah, so th those are some examples. Thank you, Frederica. And now, now if, if, uh, uh, if you are happy, uh, Elisabeth, with the answer, uh, then, then Simon, how, how do you relate to, how, what, what are your thoughts? I actually wanted to rephrase your question and, and more than asking what's the role of design, I wanted to, to say that for me, it's maybe more important when we look back at the previous question that you did about interdisciplinary collaboration, not about what is the role of design, but what is the role of creativity. And that is something that goes transdisciplinary because design is a professional field that you are taught uh, in a school, in a university. But creativity can be something that can be taught much on a much broader scale. And in that sense, also in relation to, to the question that Frederica was making about those moonshots, 
uh, ideals of, of what are those future scenarios that we want to build. I think creativity can play a crucial role there uh, because we need to learn to, to re-question and destructure the, the, the existing systems and not precisely by looking so much into, into the future technologies. Of course, they enable us to do, to find solutions, but also to look at what solutions are already existing in place. And I think in the, in the sense of also what Lisa was saying, like creativity allows us to navigate through adaptation and resilience, building bridges that today can be made out of wood, but tomorrow will be made out of concrete. And also in relation to Elspeth, that, that we should not look at interdisciplinary collaboration only from a designer's perspective, like what can I do as a designer, but how do I relate as a designer to the world? I think the questions should be posed, should be posed more on the table, not from our professional field, but more how that professional field gives us a lens on how we relate to the world. Uh, and in that sense, I think collaboration can be more horizontal without being so structured about roles of, or, or boundaries within corporate structures or, or things like that. And, and then back to that, then I think probably the right question would be, what is the role of creativity? Uh, and then for me, the role of creativity is to question the, 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 the existing systems. And I've had the privilege to study in the Netherlands uh, at, a, at an academy that does not teach design from a traditional perspective. I did not learn to design products from a conventional sense of, of making furniture or lamps or textiles, but to question the world around me. And, and that's how I design. But at the end of, of that question, the, 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 the core of that question is, how do I apply my creativity through my skills to make changes in that world around me? So, so in that sense, my education shaped me to, to think in that mindset, to put creativity before my, my professional field. I am trained as an engineer, but I never think that, I never say I'm an engineer. And I, and I always, I, that's why I also say like, I'm maybe a little bit of an anthropologist, and I may be a little bit of, of an of a archeologist, but, but my training is design, but, but my method is, is creativity. So I think in that sense, maybe I try to, to round up all the questions that are in the air, but, but I do feel that, that Federica's question of those moonshot questions are crucial because those allow us to create change that is not yet there. But we need to keep in mind that for, for, for being able to achieve those changes, we still need to look at the solutions that are already there. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I think it's not, uh, it doesn't go in waste when we say that, that the future is with the young. You just proved the case and, and you got me corrected also uh, for using design instead of creativity. We could, we could continue discussion with that because it depends on the de definition of design as well. So we, we could continue that another time. So take my word for that, Simon. We will come back to Perfect. that. But what I also want to say here before I give the floor to, to Lisa is that, that uh, we have the, we have the ambassador to Finland uh, from Netherlands with us here in the audience. And what I want to say to you is that you can be really proud of your design education. Design Academy Eindhoven is an absolutely excellent uh, design uh, school. And at very early point, they changed the thinking from uh, discipline-based design education to something totally different, of which Simone is one of a really wonderful proof. So congratulations to, to uh, the Netherlands on this respect. And Lisa, now it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, ex uh, looking forward to your reaction to both what happens in Polestar and, and what uh, Simone was saying. I, th I believe you resonate to a lot of this. Oh yes, I, I will use uh, what, what Simon just said as a springboard. Um, um, the wonderful Laszlo Moholo Nagy, an original Bauhaus teacher, 
he said design is an attitude and i love that so much is because also it means on the one side this attitude is absolutely inclusive you know you don't have to have a design attitude and uh, you know study or not study it's something which connects us all and also what it actually entails is like it helps you to focus on the problem um whereas the solution changes all the time so for an example is like we're talking a lot about co2 footprint tracking and co2 offsetting uh, where now the, the data and the research what we're doing actually realizing of course co2 footprint besides that it's just simply a symptom treatment it's not the entire solution it's like that again we are creating a solution attempt of like okay so co2 let's offset it and voila the world the world has been rescued now it's not it's like what we are trying to solve here is to reduce our admission and the attempt of a solution is this footprint tracking and it's more and more now turning out with new data that this is wrong and it's also especially you know towards the car manufacturing industry it's like it's to avoid it not to cover it up and that's like a huge discussion especially in the, in the automotive in the agriculture and in the in the construction industries in order to solve this we need a more interdisciplinary knowledge on the one side to simply be able and this is exactly what Simon did it's like to question the question which is on the table to question the solution which has given from industries on the table it's like does that actually make sense and it might have at some stage earlier because we didn't have enough data on knowledge or other stakeholders but we have to constantly constantly iterate and with that very strong design driven attitude it frees you up to iterate 85 percent of the sustainable footprint of any kind of product and service comes in the design phase so that means we have to acknowledge design as a tool and that also has been a systemic issue is because design is like so soft and gooey and kind of like the glue and because it's everywhere it also is like really difficult to catch we have a ton of data out there how any kind of digital tools are like you know how many cars how many um you know uh, frederica you just said like you know you know exactly how many parts come into a car but do we actually know how much design iterations and tools actually go in it in the entire process of it so we have to and on policy level that's like the first step is like to acknowledge that design is actually there to acknowledge it as a tool add data around it and the advantage with design is like it also emotionally brings us all together this is not about like okay uh, you have to be a phd or a mechanic or a, a, um, any kind of formal design to be allowed to participate in a conversation that time is already over is uh, we need an, an absolute inclusive and diverse conversation um, uh, in order to tackle the real real problems and design can be our our uh, design attitude can be our common denominator here thank you lisa i think uh, many of us are uh, I'm sure familiar with with the uh, figure 80 85 percent of the footprint comes already in the design phase uh, you said that that uh, this sort of gives a role definitely for design uh, I think I believe that at the same time what it what it does is that it uh, gives a lot of responsibility and uh, need for knowledge for designers but doesn't it also mean that which was discussed before it was it was simon who said that that uh or, or, no it was not simon it was someone else that design 
is an attitude. Yeah, it was you, Lisa, that, that actually everyone can do design from that thought point of view. And isn't that actually happening at the moment as well to, well, uh, to a growing, uh, growing uh, in, in a growing manner? Uh, design is a discipline at the moment who is the ownership, not only of designers, but many others as well, which of course only accelerates the cross-disciplinary, across the need for uh, cross-disciplines knowledge. So um, my question is to, uh, we will come back to Frederica and to the process still, but, but, uh, but uh, Lisa, how, how is the work or and the the 160 organizations that that work for or in the climate kick how do what is their response direct di response and actions on this fact that 80% of footprint happens in the design phase and uh, simon to you in your own processes uh, the scale of your processes is different from pole stars and different from European commissions or uh, actions in climate change or the the environment the climate kick. But how do you see this 85 percent of footprint comes from design phase? So how do you react to that? So both the the let's say the metal level and then the pragmatic level. Um, what would you respond? And maybe. Simon, if you if you start, and then I'll ask Lisa to come back to that. Yeah, thank you, Payivi. I think uh, scale is a is a the matter of scale is a very important question uh, for me uh, as a practitioner, let's say, uh, because scale um, has everything to do with design and the transformation of materials. Right, I am what I call. Uh, a, a small practitioner. I, I cannot compare myself to what Paul stars do on, on a larger scale of the transformation of matter, right? But and there, I think design has had um, owns. Uh, it, it is related to, related to the history of the world because of the industrial uh, heritage of the manufacturing of goods. So when I say I'm a small scale designer, I mean to say that I make products on a craft based Base and on a craft based scale, and, and there is a huge impact on the transformation of materials there. What is the scale of, a, of an industry? What is the, the scale of the industrial manufacturing? And what is the scale of what a, a, a designer can do on its own? And there, I feel there is like a double sided sword uh, because I feel that, um, in, my, in my perspective, in my point of view, the best design solutions are sometimes the ones that are the smallest. But for those smallest to have an impact, they need to be replicated on a larger scale. So, Pivy, I'm very happy you bring up that question. And I am always battling between this, between being a designer that works on a small scale with a small community in a gold mine, or having that system replicated by, the, by a large industry that is creating a much more larger environmental impact. So when we speak about the 80 and 85 um, uh, impact of design, I think that, that the important choices of design happens at every stage. And that's impossible to, we, we cannot alienate ourselves from that. And, and what I really appreciate of what Frederica brings to the table is that you need to understand in, in, a, in a large scale system a supply chain, right? But, but we don't need to, to we, we can also speak about that supply and change in, in, in terms of what Lisa mentioned, systemic thinking. So we need to understand every single step of the manufacturing of something or the transformation of matter or the creation of a good. Uh, and there, I think scale, I, I, I'm sorry not to be able to give a concrete answer because I think that I'm still battling with that question. How do I navigate around scale? How do I create an impact with what I do that I feel is small into the larger scale of things? So I'm still battling with that question. And, and, and as a designer, I navigate between both worlds. But I, think, but I think to consider the systemic approach of stages, it's very important to tackle that 80, 85 percent that we're talking about. And an other thing that I feel is important as a designer and coming as well from the global south 
in the context of Europe is the ecological debt that that same industrial industry, that same industrial heritage has with the world, the ecological debt that we have from the history of transformation of materials. Um, we cannot measure that scale yet, but I think with that ecological debt, we need to think of regenerative systems and to put into each of those design stages that we go through thinking of like how do we not do less bad but uh, better good right how do we transform that uh, into an opportunity for uh, regeneration and recovery uh, and maybe the impact we can do on every stage is small but i think the larger impact of the accumulation of those stages hopefully is for the better. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. A lot of important thoughts. Uh, I was asking uh, Lisa to, to uh, come back to the, the topic from uh, a sort of a larger scale point of view, definitely. But Lisa, if you can hold uh, a second, because it seems that we have, we have a question or comment a comment from from the stream from the audience uh, platform. So Anna, if uh, you can read it uh, t uh, and take uh, take the microphone, Elizabeth may may borrow it to you. Yeah, um, somebody asked if you um, could move the discussion more to the economics of biodiversity, as it like was promised in the agenda. Okay, thank you. This is something we will we will do, and actually. Uh, what we will do now is a bit uh, shifting this to the economic part. Lisa, so if it's okay, think about your answer to that part. And as, as Elsebert is having the microphone, she will be a good person to, to uh, react to that as well. Because one of the topics we, we have is if we suck also, if we succeed in climate change mitigation, how will it impact, what, what the consequences are. And definitely one of the consequences relates to economical models. So also to you then, after Le uh, first uh, Elsebeth, then uh, Lisa and then Frederica, uh, how do you see this in car industry, in your line of work? What will happen to the economics of uh, our industries when and if we succeed in uh, climate change mitigation. But Elsebet, you first. Um, yes, I hope I, uh, I can answer your question. It's not easy, but I can tell about a, a small case because I'm uh, in the advisory board for a diary in Denmark. It calls Tise Marie. It's a small organic uh, diary. And... Um, um, a diary will normally produce uh, butter and uh, cheese, but the rising prices of um, of corn just now makes it very difficult to continue uh, the traditional uh, production. So the rational thing is is to instead of uh, producing milk and butter and and cheese, then uh, take the corn and uh, prepare it to plant-based food for uh, humans. Uh, and it is really good for um, the biodiversity mm -hmm. and it's also good for our health. So, uh, and actually it could all, it, it's also, uh, it could be good for the economy of the diary now. Uh, but the problem is that for farmers and it's the farmers owing uh, the diary for them uh, to be a farmer, it's about having cows. And I understand it very well because if I only had one word to characterize a farm, then I would say a cow. Um, so one thing is to find new economic models. Uh, and that's what actually what we are doing in this diary uh, just now. But it has these new uh, economic models has to be supported by a mind uh, change in mindset. So how do we designed a new uh, mindset among farmers who, uh, who have got the farm from uh, their family and for generations have, have had cows. So this cultural shift is an important part 
of also the new economic models. And we need to find ways, if I understand you correctly, we need to find ways to support the cultural change. It will not happen on its own. No, I don't think so, because uh, I, I was very happy because I've been the one in the advisor board saying for, for some years that we have to uh, uh, be to to um, make sure that innovate that our innovation is also about plant-based uh, products, but it has been very uh, difficult to uh, to get through with uh, with this, and so the ri uh, rising prices. I said I, I got very happy when I saw these rising prices because it could address the problem we have, uh, but we still have the cultural problem. Mm. So it's not enough that you somehow um, get uh, an economic model supporting biodiversity if you don't have a mindset yeah. that can cope with it. That's, that's a very good point. And if I may ask you, Lisa, because you work now, you orchestrate policy, you orchestrate policy in the context of uh, a huge uh, group of organizations from different fields, research organizations, etc. How do you, how, how does this is this a discussion among uh, the members of the climate kick? How do you orchestrate that, and and how do you see where the solutions come to also to the cultural change needed for new economical models? And what are the economical models you are you are discussing? In, in the climate kick. Yeah, um, thanks for that. So I think in, in the context of biodiversity, um, I, I think we all agree that like biodiversity is the goal towards and the solution, uh, you know, to fix the current issues we have and that we have to strengthen and support biodiversity. The issue, comma, however, especially on the policy side, is like how to implement and strengthen biodiversity um, because we have systems which are not biodiverse driven. And um, that also, as one example also is like so EIT, the European Institute of Technology, um, which is our mothership, and we as the kicks the knowledge innovation communities, we you know are supposed to cover biodiversity based on our focuses. So we have food and agriculture and energy, digital uh, raw materials uh, um, uh, in our kicks. Um, uh, so we are all combined working on that together, but also we have to deal with the current systems of there is no incentive, no economic incentive to transition from cows into a more biodiverse system. And quite frankly, it's like if you want people to change, you have to give them an alternative in order for finding an alternative you have to understand and acknowledge their current situation. It's far too easy to say like, okay, we're all gonna die, the, the planet is going down, so we have to stop working with cows, stop driving cars. Um, yeah, that's of course the end solution, but the reality is different. We have to be very, very pragmatic about this. If we give the farmers an alternative to cows, because in the end of the day, we're talking about their livelihood and a very emotional connection also to their family business. Um, you know, if we talk about how do we bring biodiversity into the car manufacturers, well, um, we build cities which are dependent on cars. Then the discussion actually would have to have to be how do we design a society where the dependence on mobility is less, hence with cars, at the same time, how do the car manufacturers are going to make money too? Mm. Right? There's like a, so, so, so there's a whole complexity level behind this uh, involving a, a time layer also of like transition. Yes, we know where we have to go, but we also have to be very realistic working together with the industries how to um, how to make a change. And I'm saying that as like us being the biggest public privately funded 
agency on EU level for climate change is like that we have tools like taxonomy, uh, which are supposed to generate trust and help us to give incentives, investment incentives for bio, biodiverse uh, companies and innovation. It's a tool of trust. And we're currently battling with the fact that we have gas and nuclear now being flagged as green. So if you want to get an understanding of how complex the policy discussion is, that is a very good case study. In all of that, what I'm missing here is the acknowledgement of design policy and the effect of it. Again, and we have it inside as well, EIT and all of KICS haven't been built with culture creative industries in mind because simply it wasn't acknowledged on, on an EU level. That is very recent, since 2019, and it took like an immense effort of many decades that we actually got there. Now we will have a culture creative industry kick coming up as a part of the, the, the EIT family. And that is a very, very strong uh, position and message towards the industry. Um, and uh, we as Climate Kick, we are very design driven and understanding. Um, uh, but you know, the, the, what we are preparing for is that we have a new generation of design uh, driven and understanding people who also have to understand the system we are in. So yes, I'm all up for biodiversity. This is where we have to go, but we need to work with a system which is broken. And in order to that, we need the knowledge, the systemic knowledge to actually make a systemic change. So that means Simon, the, you know, because you were talking about like that, you know, sure, you know, those small things make a difference. I say that on the contrary, mostly important, keep doing what you're doing, because when we are in a huge rigid system, little design changes make all the difference. That's like, and like, if we build the clusters around it, and it's like, here's a little change, and here's a little change all across the sectors, because the issues the mobility sector has in terms of the green transition is very, very similar in agriculture, in construction, in the textile industries. And a designer is kind of like the detective walking through all of those silos and understanding and bringing together. And sometimes a little screw top is bringing together a, a, a mechanical tool, which is like totally fancy, but they can't talk to each other. So a little transition screw top can all of a sudden be a very, very strong bridge. So that's important. It's like, again, to acknowledge that we are working with a very big complex system, which is very, very rigid. Um, that the importance of little adjustments becomes even even more and creates even more impact. So be aware of your power, Simon. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Uh, Frederica, um, in relation to what you described as, as your way of doing, doing this, um, the acting as a catalyst as well, which I think is, is a very important note. Uh, and uh, what you are now doing with, with other industries, collaborating with other industries, you described the process. Um, how, do you see, how do you see the challenges related to this? Uh, is, it, is it straightforward in a way that, that you know what you, you, you have an ambition, you have a target, you, you, it's about uh, climate neutrality, the first climate neutral car by 2030. How do you do the risk analysis in a way? So uh, if sudden changes happen, um, how do you shift your approach? How are you prepared to changes? And how are you prepared also to the changes or the impact it might have for the economical models? We, we have certain types of economical models, but do you see new models in near future and how they would have an effect on how you proceed. 
Absolutely. And, and I, I think there is so much uncertainty around that. We know that we need to change the system. We know that we need to build a new capitalism, a capitalism 2.0 uh, and a new economic model. Uh, and especially in mobility, we, we need that. Uh, but there are so many insecurities today. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to acknowledge the fact that we are dependent on this. If we as a company, a young three-year-old company, want to be around in, in 10 or 20 or 30 years, we really need to, uh, in this context, just go for it and set very bold targets without knowing exactly how this, how this system will be built or how this economic model will look and how it will work, the nuts and screws and bolts of it. Um, and I, I just really want to emphasize what Lisa said, that as, as designers and engineers now, we have to really be open to the types of changes that will come in, in the coming years. And I also love the fact that you are, um, you are pointing out the, the monster that we created, offsetting. Uh, we will not rely on offsetting uh, in our work. Um, so as a designer, I, I think when it comes to these huge system perspectives, it can feel a bit delimit um, delimitating um, that that you don't know exactly how we will how we will build this or what the end goal is. But it doesn't have to be that hard. In at Polestar, we really try to make uh, decisions today. Um, that we believe will have an impact. And I also want to bring in the, the, the relationship with, between design and data. And that, for example, when we talk about biodiversity, we can really build on the work that we've done now uh, when it comes to greenhouse gas calculations. Uh, in the design phase, we have tools. We can measure the, the economic impact and, and the climate impact of our design choices. And it, it's, you can absolutely bring in biodiversity now. We know the key drivers of biodiversity loss. It's climate change, it's the way we use materials, it's pollution from chemicals and so on. And we can really calculate with these in our design choices today. It's not, it's not that hard, really. So yeah, there are complex changes in the making. Like Lisa said, policy has to step in. We have to find models and infrastructure and, and it, you can build this up to be as big as possible, but it all comes down to the simplicity of a designer making a choice based on data. And there you can bring biodiversity to the table early today. Uh, a very I can quick just like jump jump in real quick to deliver like a, a, um, an evidence of change from the EU bubble. Um, so uh, Frederica, you just like put a really good example on the table. It's like digital skills for designers to, to, to read data and then to use it in their design work. So that is, um, uh, uh, there is a huge program called Pact for Skills um, which is acknowledging the upskilling and reskilling needs in all of the 14 industry um, sectors, uh, because we have a huge need of uh, skilled labor. Because you know the discussion now also is shifting towards that nobody dares to debate that we there is a climate crisis and we have to do it. Now there is a huge issue in like really skills of sh shop workers, floor workers skills on how to implement it. We have, for instance, we're having a huge issue in the construction industry. It's like, yes, we have to switch over to heat pumps, but there is very little training and skills and actually from construction workers how to work with heat pumps. That's a very pragmatic issue um, to, to, uh, uh, um, on the ground and that has to be addressed to actually generate so much you know, impact. So like in terms of you know, the, the, the conversation on theory level now has to come to a very pragmatic, literally hands-on skill revolution, um, where also, you know, the, the, this making design as a part of the curriculum in every kind of industries, in every kind of construction workers, farmers, um, in order to have the ability to find your own solutions, because this is also what design is like the, the magic has, 
is like it gives you the creativity to understand context and how to find your own solution. It's always a little bit difficult, especially with very technical engineering tools. It's like, okay, this is the system, just follow it and everything will be fine. And designers kind of like the other way around. It's like, okay, MacGyver style, give me sticky tape and a little bit of spit and I will make something out of it. So we need like those pop, both brains working together on an EU level that is now acknowledged um, uh, to actually strengthen this relationship. Because again, going back to biodiversity, the issue is not that we are not acknowledging biodiversity is key. The issue is how we transfer and transition towards a more biodiverse economy, thinking and uh, uh, production. So the transition in between is the issue and the tool and the lack of it for the time being is skills. And that is one of the biggest flagship programs on EU level out there. And I highly recommend for everyone else uh, uh, to actually really get involved in that. Uh, Frederica, I just uh, checked, uh, um, you're not a part of the Pact for Skills for Automotive. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, I, we should we should yeah. pull we should pull you in. See, like that's why we make change publicly, openly, and call each other out <laughs> and say, like, okay, let's join the party. Well, now uh, I th <laughs> thank you, thank you, Lisa, and and thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, it has come time to to close this dialogue as well, and I very much thank all of you, uh, Frederica, Simon. Uh, Lisa and Elsebeth here. This dialogue and the set of dialogues will continue in the next Global Design Talks. This is a con continuum. We are, we are not sort of having uh, separate individual discussions. Rather, we are having a set of dialogues that, that we can continue the topics. And as said, the next one will happen in Munich, Munich Creative Business Week in uh, on uh, 17 and 18 May, again to be continued later in France and, and uh, Spain. So uh, we welcome you all there and a uh, notion that this is recorded, all the dialogues have been recorded and the recordings will be available next week. Uh, you will find a link at the Arctic Design Week. Uh, week's website, and it will be communicated with social media as well. So we are ready with the with a set of four dialogues. We are ready with with the with the uh, Arctic Design Week part of it. But what we are to expect still is the orchestration and music. I was I, I promised you. Hang on there. Uh, so that you can join listening to this. I don't know if, if our tech team will, will uh, close down the cameras, but you can hopefully hear what is happening next. And uh, as you can see, there are some men marching in. This, these uh, guys, they are, uh, they are mieskuoro huutajat, uh, screaming men's choir. And um, the, it, the choir doesn't sing a note, but simply shouts out, shouts out texts, sometimes from poems, sometimes from uh, legislation, laws, or international uh, treaties. The choir was founded already towards the end of, of 1980s. And first it started with surprise performances in whatever corners uh, of the world. It could be streets, it could be uh, events uh, in communities. And of course, it has become uh, an international success even. And later, they perf have performed uh, in various arenas, often speaking for Finland, representing Finland in the world as well. Petri Silvia is the founder, the composer, and the conductor of the choir. He is also working for Business Oulu, and one program they have is Design Oulu. And now what the choir will be uh, doing under the leadership 
of, of Petri Silvia is pohjoisen muotoilun teesit, theses for design in the north. And the ambition here is to encourage public actors, businesses to learn more, understand and use design. If Petri, you want to add something, feel free to do that. But in, in any case, the floor is you, you, yours with the design thesis of the North. Thank you very much. So uh, this is a very rare occasion. Uh, as Taivi mentioned, uh, I have two callings, two professions. Uh, and the one is uh, to work as a public servant to promote design services and uh, design uh, methods to all industries, all enterprises, big and small. But the other one is uh, that of artist, uh, a conductor, a composer for a streaming men's choir, Mieskoro Hutajat. Ladies and gentlemen, the world premiere of uh, Northern Design Statements. Tuotamme parhaita raaka-aineita, tuotamme arvokkaita raaka-aineita, tuotamme parhaita raaka-aineita, peltämme arvokkaita raaka-aineita, tuotamme parhaita raaka-aineita, heilämme arvokkaita raaka-aineita, kavalti tuotamme parhaita raaka-aineita, tuotamme arvokkaita raaka-aineita, virheemme kaaleita raaka-aineita, soiramme arvokkaita raaka-aineita, peruraan parhaita sellaineita, Thank you to the choir, and this is how you scream about design and its uh, relevance in Finnish. 
also to our international audience. Um, coffee? So, you are all welcome to uh, enjoy a cup of coffee. Uh, and also, if you haven't done that yet, uh, there are, there's a possibility, show that, Laura, to the audience. Uh, you can ha get yourself a memory of all these uh, dialogues. Uh, Laura will be shooting photos of you and a real old-fashioned paper copy, which you can get as a memory. So enjoy coffee and enjoy the photo session. And thank you very much for, for uh, being part of these dialogues. And we will continue in Munich in May. Thank you.